There you go. Okay. okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Okay, so let's uh, continue on the second part of um, uh, first order logic and model theory. Okay. So last time we already talked about uh, the softness, completeness, and compactness theorem, but I'm, I just briefly talk about it and I won't go into um, much detail in here. So yeah, to, so let's start by showing you some like sketch proof of the completeness theorem because I think uh, this proof is very interesting. Proof of completeness, sketch. Okay, so the idea of the proof of a proof of com completeness theorem that I'm gonna show you is it actually consists of uh, two parts. So the first part is we going to uh, basically uh, first we can show that uh, the first two part here, like the version one and version two of completeness theorem, they are equivalent on uh, that part. Uh, this is not hard to show, uh, which mean that in order to prove the completeness theorem, we only need to show part two. <clears throat> okay, so to show part two, what do we need to do here is, we're going to start from a set T that is consistent, right? And we're going to show that it is satisfiable. So which mean that we, uh, if we want to show that T is satisfiable, we need to construct a model of T. Okay. So we need to construct an L structure uh, that satisfy every statement in T. Okay, so now how do we do that? So the first part of this proof is we're going to consider a spatial case of this. So instead of, so we're going to consider the case that uh, when T is complete and consistent, So which mean it can, when uh, you have a, pro, uh, a formula phi, right, oops, sorry. when you have a formula phi, uh, you should have either T proof phi or T proof the negation of phi. Okay, for any formula phi, this is the definition of completeness here. And we're going to add uh, one more, uh, condition here, which say that it has the witness property, witness property. So what does this one mean? Uh, we haven't talked about this property yet. Uh, the definition of having a prop um, for a theory to have the witness property is that uh, we say that T has the witness property If uh, for every L formula phi x, if uh, whenever mm -hmm. oh. whenever T prove that x is x uh, phi x. Mm. we have uh, a constant symbol C such that uh, T prove V of C. So which, what does this one mean? It mean that whenever T can prove the existence of x in phi of x, you can find an explicit constant symbol that t prove phi of c. 
Okay, so that's what this one. Okay, and what we're going to do here is we're going to show that mm, now that we have uh, a set T with a complete with um sorry when we have a a a, a set of sentence set of sentences T that is complete, consistent, and has the witness property. We can show that if we let M, uh, okay, so let me define this one first. So for when we have terms T1 and T2, we can define an equivalence relation on the set of all terms by letting this uh, T1 is equivalent to T2, if and uh, if and only if t can prove that t1 is equal to t2. Okay, so if you have a, a variable free, so this where t1 and t2 are variable free terms. Okay, so this is, <laughs> and then if you let term L to be the set of variable free terms, L terms actually, you can construct a model of uh, these theory T by let M to be uh, term L modulo these equivalent relation, okay? Mm -hmm. And but this is not uh, it yet because when we want to construct a structure, we should have the universe and interpretation of relation symbol, function symbol, and constant symbol. So what are we going to do is we're going to let the constant uh, interpretation of each constant symbol to be the class of C, okay, the class of that constant symbol and interpretation of uh, function symbols. Let's say you have a uh, function symbol F with uh, N arity. So you're going to have T1 up to Tn here. And the interpretation of this guy is just F of T1 up to Tn here. So it's just like it's like uh, these F and the the class it's commutable. <clears throat> Commute. Okay, and for relation symbols, we're going to uh, let T1 up to Tn to be in this interpretation of Rm if and only if um, R, sorry, T proof, T proof that R T1 up to Tn. Okay, so that's uh, the idea of how we can construct uh, a model of T when T is uh, complete, consistent, and has the witness property. And you can check um, the details that this structure work. Okay, and that's the first half of it. Uh, the other half is if you want to show that if you have a set T here, if T is consistent, if T is a consistent, L theory, then you can show that there exists uh, there exists and a language L a language. L prime that extending L and uh, and L prime uh, 
theory t prime such that uh, t is a subset of t prime uh, t prime is complete and consistent and t prime has the witness property Okay, so that's uh, the idea. So if we can show that uh, T, this, this thing hole, this one here, this star hole, it means that when you have a T, right, you can extend it both a language, right? Extend the language to L prime and extend your theory to T prime so that it is complete and consistent. Now you apply the previous part to construct a model M that is a model of T prime. But this guy, this M right here, if you take the reduct of it to the, the, the language L, you're gonna get a model of T. This is a model of T. Okay, so that's the idea of how we, uh, how, we um, how this proof go. And there is another interesting thing about the construction of this, which is in order to construct these L prime and T prime. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a, a tower. So let's see what do we need to do here. So we first start from T, right? And we want to extend these T to make it uh, uh, complete and have the witness property. So here we're going to start from the language, our language L. Okay, T is an L theory. Okay, but right now it is possible that T might not be complete. So what we can do is we can add more L sentences to this uh, and get a new sentence that is complete. Okay, so we're going to add more uh, sentences to make it complete. So here we are and consistent as well. Every step here, we're going to try to guarantee that it is consistent. And once we can make it complete, but when it is complete, you have more statements, right? And when you have more statement, you might have something like this, T1 proof, something like this. But sometimes we, you can imagine that if you start with a language with no constant symbol, right? When you add these type of sentences, these type of sentences to your theory, there is no way that you can witness the existence of an object in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to expand our language and let it to be, and call it L1. And we're going to go from here back to here. And this is to, uh, so we're going to uh, build a new language L1 to make sure that we have enough constants that can witness everything that is occurring here. So here, what we're going to do in this step is we're going to add constant symbols, constant symbols. Okay. And, but when you add more constant symbols to this, you lose the completeness because there were more statements that you don't know whether you can prove it or not. So what you're gonna do next in the next step is you're gonna add more statement into your set T2 and trying to make it complete. And you're gonna repeat this over and over again. So we're gonna repeat this process. And at the end, you can get uh, this tower and another tower right here. Yeah, you, so you get two towers. 
and you can take uh, L prime to be the union of L n when n is a natural number and you can take T prime to be the union of these Tn. Okay, so and uh, it's turned out that once we take the union of this, we can show that it is complete, consistent, and has the witness property. Okay. And that's the idea of uh, these completeness of how we prove completeness theorem. Okay, so that's the end of the sketch of this proof. And another interesting thing about the completeness theorem is its consequences, which is the compactness theorem. When we talk about the compactness theorem, uh, compactness theorem, the form that I usually use is this one. We say that if every uh, finite subset of T is satisfiable, then you can, you're gonna have that T is also satisfiable. So which mean that uh, if you want to uh, show that your set T has a model, what you need to do is you just need to show that uh, every finite subset of it has a model, okay. And there is a classic application of this in graph theory. So let me uh, give you some nice application of compactness theorem. So we can talk about uh, k-colorable graph, right? Okay, when we have a graph uh, G, which is equal to VE, where E is the set of vertices, and E is the set of edges, Okay, we're going to say that uh, this graph G is k colorable if there exists, uh, if you have a, a k color, uh, you have color C1, C2, up to CK, right? And you can color vertices here, which each color, like one vertice is going to be painted by one color, okay? One vertices is painted by exactly one color and it must satisfy the condition that if two vertices are adjacent, then you're gonna get that they have different colors, V and W, have different colors. Okay, so here is what we have. <clears throat> and it's turn uh, and there is a result in graph theory that say that actually it's for infinite graph that is more interesting. Uh, we can show that if every finite, subgraph of G is K colorable, then uh, you can show that G is colorable, is K colorable. Okay, and how do we do that? So the idea of how we can prove this using a uh, compactness theorem, proof and sketch as well. Uh, using compactness theorem is instead of consider G as an, uh, an object, as a graph. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to use theory or set of sentences lists of properties that we would like the G to have, 
and trying to get some result out of it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to construct a set T, okay, such that if it's if we can have a model, if T has a model, it must imply that G is K colorable, right? So that's what we need. Okay. So here, what uh, what do I want to do is uh, we're going to have, oh, I forgot to talk about the language, right? Otherwise, I cannot talk about T. Mm. So here, let's consider the our language. Our language is going to consist of two parts, OK? It's going to have constant symbols, and it's going to have relation symbols. There are two types of it. So first, I want to be able to talk about object in the set G, in the vertices of G. So here, I'm going to let V be my constant symbols. Every object in the vertices are my constant symbol. And what else do we have? And then we're going to have relation symbols. So we're going to have a binary relation for ages, binary relation symbol, binary relation symbol. Okay, and in order to talk about the colors, I'm going to have a C1 up to CK to indicate that um, if a vertices satisfy one point, one point uh, satisfying each relation symbol here, it's going to indicate that it has that color. So these are unary relation symbols. Okay, and the statement that we're going to have here is we're going to say that uh, if we're going to have that for each, uh, we, I'm sorry, uh, we're going to have that these set T know what G look like. So here it's going to have a sentence. Uh, V E W whenever you have that V V E W okay so you're going to add this statement so that you have an a copy image of um uh, of the the graph in your 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 set T so if it has an H you must have a statement that say it has an age. Okay, and what else do you need here? Uh, you need to have that a statement that say that for every v, for every vertices. Uh, let me put it in these uh, quotation mark that uh, v has exactly one color. Okay, so we're going to have the statement for every V, V has exactly one color. And what else do we need here? Um, we know that in this case, it means that every color, uh, every vertices has to be painted. But we need one more condition that if V has an H, right? Mm -hmm. If V has an uh, H, right, then the next part, it's going to, um, so this is V0. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to say that if V and E, uh, oops, uh, the next part, it's going to say that for every point C, and uh, for every point B0 
and for every point v1, if v0 has an h to v1, uh, if they have the same color, if they both satisfy the same color, c uh, i v0 and c uh, c i v1, then you're going to have that there is no h between v1 and v0. And we're going to let these range over the set of all colors that we have. So what does this one mean? This is a cop, is, these say that we know everything about the graph, right? And the second part say that every point, every vertices has to be painted by exactly one color. And the last part is say that, uh, the last part say that if the two points are adjacent, then it must have different colors. Okay. And once we have this, you can show that if, uh, if T has a model, it means that you can have these way of, you can have these relations in both C1 up to CK that can interpret the painting of vertices, right? So if T has a model, you know that it, you can color, you can color your graph G. Okay. Excuse me. Excuse mm -hmm. me. Okay. Uh, I think T should have a uh, negation of VEW for no adjustment VW. Uh, sorry? Which one? The first one. The first one? You, you wrote VEW for any uh, VW uh, with the adjustment. But I think you need to add the negation of VEW for VW. Uh, yes, right. This one? Yes. Because this statement T uh, only uh, says that uh, it can be, G can be uh, embedded uh, as a homomorphism. Oh, right, 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 right. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And you need to have, uh, uh, right. And you need to have that if, Right, this one, right? Yes. Yes, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I skipped that part. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. So this, this, gonna, uh, this first uh, uh, line gonna say that we know everything about the, how the two vertices are connected. Right. Okay, and once you have this, you can show that uh, if T has a model, you know how to uh, paint uh, each vertices. Okay. And the idea on how we can show that this one has a model is we're going to use the property that if every finite subgraph of G is K colorable, right? Uh, G is K colorable. So what we're going to do here is by comparing compactness theorem by compactness theorem it is enough to show that uh, every finite uh, subset of T is uh, has a model, right? Has a model. Okay. And the idea is if you have a finite subset of T, 
it can in, involve only finitely many vertices, which mean that you can uh, consider a subgraph, a finite subgraph of G that contain all of those vertices. And you, once you have a finite subgraph of G that contain all those uh, vertices and you have all the edges that is related to those points, then you're going to know that it is, um, by the assumption, you're going to get that it is k-colorable, which means those finite subset of t going to have a model. So you can get a model of uh, every finite subset of t. So you can get that g is k-colorable as well. OK. So this is a, a classic uh, application of a compactness theorem in graph in graph theory. Okay, and what else that I would like to say about um, here is so let's consider. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, Aye. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a model of t. But uh, it is an extension of G. Right. So but, you, I think you mm -hmm. need to. Uh, yeah, actually, you get need a to, subset, yeah. Right. So actually, you're going to get a, a graph G prime that is an extension of a graph G, right? But if G prime is K colorable, then G is also K colorable. Uh, this is what uh, you mean, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't want to go into that detail because I can afraid it's my miss uh, the the key idea. But yeah, you're you're correct. If you want to be, um, if you want to be more precise on this, actually. Mm, there is a part that I'm going to present later that it's going to involve, about the, it's going to relate it to this part. And we're going to call that, this is the diagram of your, of your structures or something like that. Mm -hmm. And when you have a model of your diagram, it's going to mean you're going to have a model of an extension. And you can see that uh, when you consider this property, uh, this property has the pro uh, it it's has the property that it's hereditary, which means that if you have uh, two structures M and N, right? If uh, the larger one satisfy this property then the smaller one going to satisfy that's those property as well. Mm -hmm. Because it's the quantifier is of the quantifier of fraud. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. And I, I will, I will explain more a little bit later. <clears throat> Okay, and let me introduce you a little bit more notation. So here, when you have um, two structures, M and N, right? Uh, one thing that we would like to talk about these, when, when we study math, usually when we uh, have two structures, we would like to compare them or find some correlations between this, these two structures. And one thing that we usually have is we would like to have a function that uh, map or embed one structure into another structure. For example, if you have a really nearly uh, linear order, right, uh, L1 and L2, Here, uh, in order to say that these you can embed one linear order into another linear order, you usually want to say that oh you can have a map H that preserve order right that preserve 
order these two orders right? or order preserving map like that and that's for the binary relation uh, post set uh, or linear order less than or equal to but uh, for uh, let's say you can consider in algebra you can think about graph theory so if you have a graph g1 e1 and then star one right and you graph g2 e2 and then star two and inverse as well you when you want to construct a map that tell, tells some relation between these two groups you usually have a, a, a group homomorphism h right which preserve the constant right it's going to map a constant to a constant and if you have um h of a star b you're going to have that h a star h b right? so you're going to have a map that commute with your operation this is star one, this is star two. Okay. And we can see that there is um, these type of map that occur very often in the study of math. So we're trying to uh, get a, how we use it. Uh, we're trying to summarize those concepts here. So we call L homomorphisms is a map from M to N. So let me erase this. Uh, an alphomorphism is a map from M to N such that for every R in R and A1 up to RD of uh, R in M, we're going to say that A1 up to A RD of R is in the interpretation of R in M. Then you're going to have that H A1 up to H RD of R is in the interpretation of R in N. Okay, and here and next, we want something that map constant to constant, the same constant, okay? And we have H of interpretation of F in M of A1 F to A R E D of F. It's equal to when you apply H to each one of these first and then apply the interpretation of function symbol later okay and we're gonna say that uh f uh, sorry h is a strong l homomorphism if the converse of this whole okay and uh next we say that and L strong L homomorphism is an L embedding if it is an if it is an injection. And L isomorphism is a surjective L embedding. Okay. And we say that two structures are isomorphic if uh, they, we have an isomorphism between them. Okay. And there is a um here you can see that when you talk about homomorphisms, homomorphism, homomorphism acts pretty nicely with the symbols in our language, right? Um, especially for homomorphisms, it acts pretty nicely with the constant symbols and uh, function symbols. And constant symbols and function symbols are symbols that we use to construct terms. So as a result, we can use the induction on the complexity of term to show that actually your L homomorphism can commute with the term, right? So if you want to compute uh, edge of the terms, TM, the interpretation of the terms in A1 up to AN, what you can do is you can apply H to each A1 up to AN first and then apply uh, and add it to the terms later. Okay. 
And okay. And next, we already talk about the terms. So the next part, we are going to have a formula then. And it's turn out that if you have an out embedding, you can get that for any quantifier free out formulas, uh, A1 up to AM, you're gonna get that M satisfy phi A1 up to AN if and only if and satisfy H A one up to H A N, right? So you can uh, apply H to each one and then map from the row M to the row N if we only consider quantifier free formulas. However, this one does not hold in general. For example, you can think about this structure, uh, Z and zero, minus and plus and you can think about r zero uh, minus and plus right so you can embed this guy into this structure however when you think about uh, these two structure uh, let me call this guy m and let me call this guy n okay here you can see that uh, in this in this structure R, you can have a formula or something like this. For every object in here, for every V0, you can find V1 such that V1 plus V1 is equal to V0, okay? So for here, you can say that uh, N satisfy the property that for every uh, object in the reals, there is another real number such that uh, two times that number is equal to V0. Or you can say something like oh, V0 divided by two is still a real number, okay? However, that is not true in this case, in here. In here, it does not satisfy those statements, right? Because in uh, the integers, you have odd integers, right? Which you cannot divide by two. Nope, not the same. So here you can see that um, homomorphisms cannot preserve the properties from here to here. Okay, we cannot preserve sentences. Uh, okay, so there is a question that um, then what, what can we do here? Is there a homomorphisms that can preserve this property that can be served that oh, these two structures satisfy the same properties. And that's the next part. We're going to say that H is an elementary L embedding from M to N. If H is an embedding and for every L formulas uh, and A1 up to AN in M, M satisfy phi A1 up to phi N if and only if and satisfy HA1 up to HAN, okay? And we can show that every L isomorphism is an elementary L embedding. Okay, so that's a, a pretty nice idea, but mean that, um, yeah, like if you only consider 